you have stepped into an experiment that is going extremely well. An experiment that is set to set a new precedent. I'll even go further, a paradigm shift for what things look like from here on. And when you stepped into this building this morning, you've actually uh, expressed an interest and a willingness to engage in what is going to be historic. There will be case studies written about what we do here. There he is.
truly a labor of love that made this happen. So I'm excited to share with you um, this, a little bit of an Ally Media project. So initially I thought I was going first because we were going alphabetically. But uh, <laughs> it's actually because of AMP's elder status. And so that essentially means that it's virtually impossible for me to tell the, such a comp rich and complex story as AMP's in the time that we have today. Um, so Ally Media Projects cultivates and nourishes media for liberation through radical movement infrastructure. By media, we mean all the ways that we use to express ourselves. By infrastructure, we mean the systems and structures needed to support um, media making, the movements that use media making for organizing. And that infrastructure has looked like many things throughout the years. It has looked like convening infrastructure in the form of the Allied Media Conference. It has looked like administrative and back-end support in our sponsor projects program and fiscal sponsorship work, and it has also looked like infrastructure, like physical infrastructure, where we all are here today, and the reason we're here today, the love building. So that was our lovely Ally Media Projects team, and we're, we, we do this work in the legacy of everyone who has come before us, because we are a 25-year-old organization. It's impossible to name and acknowledge all the people who have shaped and worked at AMP um, through the years. So Ally Media Project started from humble beginnings in 1999 as the Midwest Fest in Bowling Green, Ohio. Um, the festival, the Zine Fest became the Ally Media Conference in 2002 and AMP officially became uh, a nonprofit then as well. And we moved the organization to Detroit in 2007. So we like to say that Ally Media Projects is a story about how one thing leads to another. And I'm going to share a little bit of that story, just a, a small fraction, um, to exemplify that. So imagine the year is 2004. A group of Detroit youth are piling into the car, putting their, carefully putting their posters and zines in the trunk alongside their backpacks and their duffel bags. They're pooling gas money, they're passing DJ privileges um, on their way to Bowling Green, Ohio for the Ally Media Conference. They return year after year and realize how important Detroit is, how important a place is, that Detroiters are making, are in, on the ground in their neighborhoods coming up with solutions to our most pressing problems, creating possibilities and modeling possibilities for others. They realize this despite mainstream media, the stories of a broken, violent Detroit, a blank slate, a city in need of saving. Those youth become conference leaders and they moved the organization and the conference to Detroit, transforming the Allied Media Conference into one of the largest, most important convenings of people making all kinds of media for, for media for social justice. Nice. They start to think about what role they can play outside of the conference and begin organizing with other community groups around digital justice. They apply for and receive a federal broadband technology grant to create a digital literacy training program to teach digital media skills alongside entrepreneurship, education, art, and community organizing skills. And there are some folks in here today that were part of that. Uh, the community leaders who join the training bring their no new knowledge and expertise back into the communities, creating ripple effects. Programs evolve from the training, including digital stewards that supports the creation of community wireless mesh, net mesh networks across Detroit that eventually become Detroit Community Technology Project and Detroit Future Schools, an in-school digital media arts program and teacher development program that is now People in Education. Their office on Third Street is a vibrant hub for organizing and media making, where community comes together to strategize and collaborate, and the computer lab is a site 
for everything from website and graphic design to electronic music and film production. And that film production eventually includes the inaugural cohort of Detroit Narrative Agency Fellows. They grow their expertise in nonprofit finances through the management of that federal grant and realize that they can take on the responsibilities of being a nonprofit so others don't have to, and develop a fiscal sponsorship program to resource, support, and keep safe the organizing and media making that's expanding our imaginations towards liberation year round. So 2024 marks a decade of fiscal sponsorship, meaning that we share our nonprofit status and infrastructure with groups that, so that they can access funding that they wouldn't otherwise have access to, namely foundation grants and donations. We provide supportive administrative and operational services to manage those funds and realize the visionary work of those projects. We do that by centering relationships, scaling with those projects, and providing culturally and politically competent support to a majority queer, trans, and BIPOC media makers working at the cutting edge of the movements for liberation. Essentially, we do the unglamorous, vital work of supporting organizers and media makers by helping them edit their grants, pay their vendors, hire employees, and so much more in an effort to make the radical practical. Through fiscal sponsorship, we support a flourishing media ecosystem that locally, along with some of the organizations um, in the Love Building, includes projects like Motor City Straight Dance Academy, DAM, Ghost Light Arts Initiative, Healing by Choice, Design Justice Network, Black Lives Matter Detroit, Detroit Lit, Detroit Safety Team, Emergence Media, and so, much, so many more. While we have a commitment, a specific commitment to Detroit, AMP currently provides fiscal sponsorship to 120 projects across the country, including Puerto Rico. <laughs> $25 million to resource critical liberatory work led by our community to sponsor projects. $35 million of those dollars are specifically went to those two Detroit based projects. And that, and that is not, that's not all the money that we've helped steward. That's not the money that has, those are those include the resources um, that made the Alley Media Conference and our other programs possible and it doesn't include what it took to uh, bring the love building to life. So what's next for AMP? So we're expanding our work through what, an area, a new area um, called Network Resources that will expand our support to our network of projects rooted in skill and resource sharing, adding services and events, and developing uh, Detroit Projects Incubator. We also, provide the back end for everything that the love building does as well. So we're the administrative support for them as well. So we, ima we imagine the love building as a living emergent container for the practice of new worlds. The love building makes possible what we, takes what we made possible in four days during the Alley Media Conference into something that can happen uh, year round. So the Love Building, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak a little bit about the Love Building from our specific point of privilege. You're gonna hear more about uh, the Love Building later as well, but it took ten, over 10 years of dreaming, five years of building, and one year of breathing life into this, this building. And it really did, I want you to know that it really has been over a decade of dreaming when the staff and AMP were dreaming about having an office with, filled with partner organizations with abundant natural light, and we really do believe in the power of manifestation. And so, picking a little bit of my privilege again, um, you can see the transformation of what was um, 4721 Grand River into what is now the local thing. And here is some images 
from this past year since our soft opening last year. Um, so you can see we truly are breathing life into this building. And so I want to leave, end my part by leaving you with the words of our beloved mentor and ancestor, Grace Lee Box, who reminded us often that we survive by taking care of each other. And as you learn about the other groups um, and tenant partners in the building, uh, I want, I'm going to ask you to allow yourself to be odd because it's truly exceptional that each one of these groups exists, that they're doing the work that they're doing, and that all of that had to happen to make it possible. The inspired conversations, the chance encounters, the bold visions, the sheer determination, the labor, the care, and loving hand, like countless loving hands day in and day out. And with that, you know, follow our newsletter and come visit us um, on the fourth floor and learn more about Anne. Okay. 
okay, what the what notice is do you have for workers or state to be to work with in my role session? Hello everybody, I'm Bucky and I just want to share that I thought this was a very which way do I go? To <laughs> um, I thought this was a very interesting couple of minutes. I learned a lot about the person I was talking to. Um, and we share common bonds. So I love that I'm already growing in love with somebody else who is ready um, immediately. Since that's who's all walking in the building. Oh nice. Thank you. 
said this earlier, but I am one of three co-executive directors. So now we have a shared leadership model. So it's myself, Jose, and Syra, and this is the current leadership at I. So three of us hold three different arms of um, roles for executive directors. We also do internal programming. And Syra works with our youth programming. I work primarily with um, the leaders in education, and then Jose works with our teachers and our veterans. Um, then we also have our five fellows. So these are folks in the community who help us. Tina Crenshaw, who is one of our facilitators with Radical Wellness, is a program that we do for educational leaders. Um, and Maya Davis, she is a local artist. She works with Cyra and the youth program. And they get a fabulous program called Community Medicine, where um, young teachers would be their first five years teaching would come and they would literally just have dinner together. But it wasn't just them. We would prepare, they would prepare the meal from beginning to end and sit and eat. Um, and it became literally community as medicine. So here's a little bit of um, just our work since 2011. So since 2011, our work has included working with 100 plus educators. And if you look here, this is an early picture of me when I first started investing with five. Um, 100 plus educators. Uh, we done a program and created space and experience for 3,000 plus young people, partnered with over 25 organizations, and we created over 50 media projects. Um, <laughs>
representing seniors, youth, environmental justice communities, welfare rights activists, hip hop community organizers, independent technologists, and designers. The common ground we stood on the idea that communication is a fundamental human right. And I, I think you've heard that a lot since then, especially after COVID. So the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition principles, um, you know, were collaboratively created by the community and they focus on access, community ownership, participation, and healthy communities. There's actually 13 principles. Um, you can go to the next slide. Digital justice demystifies technology to the point where we can not only use it, but create our own technologies and participate in decisions that will shape communications infrastructure. Um, so we created Discotex, multimedia neighborhood technology fairs where experts in technology and those willing to share their digital and electronic tricks with others, not only computer science majors or network engineers or hackers. The idea behind these discotheques was to bring out the expert in people rather than bring experts to teach. This is the flyer from the first discotheque. Um, at the discotheques, you would see DDJC members teaching participants how to use the open data portal. This, that was good. <laughs> and here you see um, Mrs. Leonard teaching Mom Gwen how to send photos via text on her flip phone. <laughs> and I just wish you all could be there. Uh, the energy that was was going on um, was just um, was just super. I guess transformative to everybody there, especially me. Um, and basically just all the work that happened really influenced, um, you know, when broadband access was a big deal during COVID. Like, all the work we did really affected that. In addition to needing more relevant digital literacy trainings, access to affordability remain major barriers to broadband adoption in Detroit. So after two years of teaching people how to create their own media, we partnered with the Open Technology Institute to teach people how to create their own infrastructure. This was the Digital Stewards Program that first piloted in 2012 and fully launched as part of DFM in 2013. These practices were also being adopted in New York City where the Red Hook Initiative adapted the curriculum to train youth um, and maintaining the Red Hook Wi-Fi, which serves several public housing units in the Red Hook neighborhood. Um, we began working with wireless mesh network technology because they could both be distributed with wireless internet connections as well as serve local network or in intranet. The intranet part offers opportunity to create local applications that foster collaboration and information sharing. Um, with support from Open Technology Institute, we supported six groups in building networks in Detroit. They were organized and maintained by residents of the neighborhood that the mesh covers. And this is a picture of kind of the areas in past border that we cover. Um, these technologies we're using, the mesh technologies, were all kind of brand new. Um, and things didn't always work the way we wanted them to. So um, the next phase um, was the EII program, where we would um, work with neighborhood anchor institutions and they would each share gigabit connections. The stewards, the digital stewards were trained and then they would train more digital stewards. Um, 
and then go out and install 50 households for each uh, organization. And in, in this process, we also created a handbook that was not only used as Taylor Network in Detroit, but also used as part of the Rise New York um, Resilient Communities Digital Stewards Program. So um, there are actually um, three or four different digital stewards programs, and um, you can you can kind of trace the, the beginnings of some of the other programs that kind of copy us. Um, you know, even T-Mobile has a digital something or other. Um, but they kind of they kind of always miss the mark. <laughs> you know? um, and another another aspect of the EI program is um, building in redundancy and um, just things you can use during disasters. One is the solar charging stations, and I think there are five up in Detroit neighborhoods right now. Um, they provide internet. Um, internet and a place to charge your, your uh, cell phones and other devices. So this was the, the first EII class. Um, and the oldest member was 65 and the youngest was 17. Um, it shows the internet support to everybody and uh, people want to learn new and emerging technologies. Uh, I'll talk about kind of our, some of our current projects. Um, kind of, we used to talk about this as like, wouldn't it be awesome if we could get some radios up on, you know, Michigan Central Station? And back then it was, you know, we weren't allowed to go in there. Um, and we got, we were able to get some connections with Ford and the Michigan Central Station. And right now, Grace Action, one of our VII works, is working on putting up some radios that could potentially serve um, you know, that red area. On top of that, um, GIA has like the, they did the first fiber project um, on the, in Southwest Detroit. Um, and our work in UCC is working on a new fiber project on Elders and Cape, which is, uh, still in the works. And, um, you know, at the beginning of our program, we started out, you know, each org was going to do 50 homes. Now we're up to over 600 homes. Um, and Authentically through media. 
Um, and then we'll go and talk about like who we are as a team. <clears throat> I mean, first we'll talk about this. <laughs> All right, here's my story. Um, so DNA was founded in 2015 by Gil Weaver and Adrian Marie Brown with the, he with the help of Jeanette Lee from Ally Media Projects with a primary focus on disrupting harmful narratives about Detroit. We focus on non extrative media storytelling, centering and amplifying the voices of our city, and providing skill building opportunities within film and media production with a focus on community impact. DNA also contributes to the growth of film and media ecosystem in the area and globally. And here's our team. So first, this is our executive artistic director. Her name is Ryan Pearson. Um, she will be here soon, um, so you'll be able to meet her. Um, but she is a native Detroiter, and she's also the executive artistic director. Um, she has degrees from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor in theater, and then in, um, theater, in arts administration from the University of California in Santa Cruz. Um, right now, as the, as the executive artistic director here, um, she is basically leading us through um, what we, leading us through all of our programming, helping, um, coming up with programming and making sure that we are collaborating with all of the residents in Detroit. And then there's me. I am the administration manager. I, manager. Um, I come from a background in creative youth development, and so I am starting my journey in media. Um, but one thing that has been over the course of my life is that my um, my professional career has been supporting and helping artists so they can make their art, and that is what I'm doing here at TNA as well. Our program. So we have um, some programs, and we'll talk about each one. So first, we have our Emerging Filmmaker Fellowship. Um, the, fel the fellowship it supports a cohort of BIPOC filmmakers in Detroit to develop short films and accompany community strategies. So our fellows, they receive funds because we need funds to make our film. But outside of that, um, they also receive mentoring. They um, are able to um, learn more about creating their own legal entity and what that looks like as they go through. Um, they also participate in a myriad of workshops throughout the year and of course some team building. Um, so we do have a cohort that is going on right now and you'll meet them in the next slide. So our 24-2025 20, fellows are Ifayomi Christine, Chris Impact Sutton, Joe Russell, and Costa Sirvinis. Um, and they are currently working with us. They started with us in May. They'll be working with us all the way through November 20, uh, 2025. I was about to say 2015. Uh, <laughs> 2025. And we hope to see you all soon when, when, in November, around that time when we do their premiere of all of their short works. Um, we're very, very, very excited about this. This is the, we haven't been able to do a fellowship basically since. Uh, DNA was started, and so we're really excited to be able to do this and to continue that work. Our next program is Radical Remedies, which is a rapid response video project. I actually got involved in DNA in a little bit through Radical Remedies, the first one that happened in 2020. Um, so basically there is a prompt that is set out for anyone who is interested in responding to the prompt. And the prompt will ask a question and then you respond um, with um, some, sort, some sort of film. I made mine on my iPhone with clips that I had from throughout the entire time. So you don't have to be, um, you don't have to have access to a lot of equipment. We just want to be able to hear what you have to say. Um, the first one was about the dual pandemics of um, anti-black violence and COVID-19. And then the second one was about environmental justice, which we um, did in partnership with the TED, and I can't remember the name, TED, the, their environmental um, arm. And they were here in Detroit last year. So um, our people who, the people who do um, submit, we select some to be able to um, be screened. Um, they also receive an honorarium. And um, we try to share, share why. Um, our next is our workshop series. 
which we're in the midst of. We're almost at our last workshop. Um, it's a collection collection of intensive classes geared toward beginning filmmakers and people who want to learn more about filmmaking. Um, they run the gamut of creating a pitch deck for film to learning what all of the below the line, which I never heard of until this time, different roles are. Um, where we've done cinematography, um, and then we also were able to partner to do a 16 millimeter workshop here with Moth Light Collective. So we're really excited to share um, those workshops. So if you see any of them, please come join, because if you're ever interested in filmmaking, it's a great place to come. Um, and then we have our film screening series called Ethics and Aesthetics. Um, and we screen um, and examine socially, re socially relevant films for form, content, and technique through public screening and discussion. Um, the last Ethics and Aesthetics we did was with Dream Hampton, and we watched a few of her short films. And so we were very excited to be able to do that and look out for more. And um, then we have all of our supporters, which we're all very, very thankful for. Um, of course, we are a sponsor project with Allied Media Project, but we um, are very grateful to all of the rest of the supporters with that. And in the next slide, you can find out ways to continue to support um, DNA, or if you just want to keep in touch, we have a mailing list. Our mailing list does not just share information with that is happening. Um, with DNA, but with lots of organizations throughout the country. Um, we're able to share if there are other places that people can submit films, um, where people can get funding for their films. Um, so if you want to keep in touch and know what we're doing, continue to do that. And then you can also follow us at DBT Narrative on Facebook and Instagram as well. people with legal work that you don't need an attorney for. We call that democratizing the law, making uh, legal systems a bit more accessible for people who don't have access to traditional lawyers. Before we get into what DJC does, just, just take just a moment, just a moment here, and think about a time in your life where you have felt the most safe. Maybe you were a child, maybe you know, you're know you just snuggled up with a grandparent or something. Just think about that time. Now think about a time in your life where you felt the most free. Maybe you were on a swing going really, really high. Maybe you just got off of punishment. <laughs> maybe you just got off of work. <laughs> think about those times where you felt the safest and the freest. And I'm going to tell you that at the Detroit Justice Center, we consider ourselves to be an abolitionist organization. We are attempting to end mass incarceration. And with that, what we are doing is not just re-examining what safety and freedom are, but really, really diving into what freedom and safety really are beyond policing, beyond jail. How do we do that? <laughs> We have a three-pronged approach at DJC. Uh, defense, offense, dreaming. Defense, offense, dreaming. And what does that what does that look like? I've got some homies here from each of these amazing departments. Our defense is a direct services. It's the issues that face our day-to-day -day lives. Our legal services and advocacy practice, which we have two of our amazing attorneys. Here. Our offense, our economic equity practice, which I do believe I saw Eric uh, a little bit earlier, um, and then our dreaming, our just cities, and our just residency. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Our values, how we do this work of liberation, true liberation, empowerment. We do nothing, of, our empowerment and collaboration, those go together. We do nothing without community. Those closest to the problem are going to be closest to the Closest to the solution. <laughs> we work with our community. We don't tell people what to do. We I work with some brilliant people. Our founder went to Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. 
she never told people what to do. She never talked at people. It was always a collaboration and innovation. In order to talk about these systems that we're trying to tear down and build something, we have to be creative. We have to be innovative. We cannot be doing the same things and expecting new results. Defense, <laughs> legal services and advocacy. In the state of Michigan at any given time, there are between 50 and 70% of people that are incarcerated are incarcerated pre-trial, pre-conviction. What do we think those people are in there for? <laughs> and what are they not paying for mostly? Traffic tickets. Most people, there is a huge percentage of people who are incarcerated for not paying traffic tickets. The number two warrant issued in Michigan is failure to appear. What did they fail, fail to appear? Traffic. We are incarcerated. When we talk about mass incarceration, we're not talking about murderers and drug dealers only in Jackson. We are talking about people on Mound Road who are just waiting for an appointment at 36th District Court and our surrounding courts, because Detroit does this and it does work in Washington, Oklahoma, and Oakland counties as well. <laughs> <laughs> so to uh, be, we talk about like eliminating mass incarceration, we, we start there. You should be in jail for these traffic offenses, for child support or marriages. That's not really helping the child, the family, or anyone else. In addition to uh, that part of defense, you have people like <laughs> Ms. Sonia Bonnet and me and Chris was just here a minute ago, helping Detroiters. We helped hundreds of Detroiters to the tune of $300 million in savings for property tax assessment appeals. This city of Detroit was over assessing and overcharging to the tune of six hundred million dollars. How much the city had taken in the six years that we worked here, we helped hundreds of Detroiters get those property tax assessments corrected, and then we also advocated and worked with the Coalition for Property Tax Justice uh, to, like, I don't know, fix the problem <laughs> so we don't have to continue doing the appeals. Uh, and in addition to that, our expungement. Um, offense, we can't just stay on defense. Defense wins games, but you still, you gotta have some points on the board too. What are we doing on this other end? Our economic equity practice. Detroit used to be the highest concentration of black home ownership in our country. We are now a renter city. And even the rent is still not affordable. What does that, look like? What are some of the innovative approaches to the uh, housing crisis, to affordable housing crisis? We have amazing attorneys and workers in our deep practice uh, working with even more amazing clients at Detroit Cultivator Community Land Trust and Detroit, where we are looking at other ways to, to even imagine affordable housing, affordable community spaces. And we talk a lot of home ownership doesn't mean building wealth and being rent, building generational wealth. Community land trusts are a way to build community wealth in a sustainable, sustainable way. And our e practice has done, uh, when y'all hear community land trusts in the city of Detroit, you will probably see Eric's face, he's up on the second floor, and, and Mark, because they've done so, so much work in this field and really getting us talking. Detroit was a little bit behind the ball on community land trust because across the country we see a bit more of it, but we're getting there. We are getting there. <laughs> Dreaming. This is the best, oh, that Eric, right on, not on time, but yes. <laughs>
that is, my children see it every day, it's right by their school, $300 million to jail and cage children. If you had that money, what would you build instead? We have these down here, and if y'all come to visit us up on the second floor, please, I, I beg of you, think about what you would build instead. Additionally, what are your freedom dreams? We keep these, we have stacks of these from events we've done over the years, hundreds of these, and we keep them and we compile them. So what does dreaming look like? Our Just Cities Lab, divest, invest. How do we take this money from here that's not working? Jails have not kept us safe from so far. How do we take the money from that and invest it in our communities? When we look at the safest communities, I mean, think about the safest place you've ever been. Was it like tons of police? Was it tons of jails? Probably not. When I see the police, they get a little nervous. So we know, what do we take from there and invest? The Metro Detroit Restorative Justice Network. Again, what are we building? If we're taking away punitive punishment and we're kind of saying retribution and, and vengeance isn't, that's not the way, that's not working. Restorative justice is true conflict re resolution, true healing um, in community. And we have an amazing, um, amazing uh, director of this who works and she has different cohorts. Just finished a third cohort of uh, training circle leaders in restorative justice practices so we can expand that into our community, into our everyday lives. We've also had an amazing, we're on our third artist in residency. Just like in the Love Building, how there's all this wonderful art, justice, as we've kind of seen from our other uh, neighbors. What does it look like? What does a world without police and incarceration, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? And we've had artists and residents that have really, really been able to kind of capture that and, and translate it into beautiful, beautiful artwork. We do this work with joy. We do this work with the belief that we are working ourselves out of the job. Sonia and I said five years ago, we do not want to be talking about property taxes for the next five, 10 years, and guess what? The property tax issue has, has it's gotten better. There, there's been ordinance, there's been tons of stuff and improvements in that work. And that's what we want to continue to see, but we have to believe in it to get there. There's a James Baldwin quote, I cannot tell the children there is no hope. We do this work with hope and love and community. We are community ourselves, and there is joy in, in it. So I hope that y'all come visit us up on the second floor. Um, most of us are here to answer questions. Don't come to our attorneys talking about all your legal <laughs> issues. <laughs> like they can answer some general stuff, but you, some of the stuff you might need to hire an attorney for. <laughs> um, but we are here also, um, as you'll find out more about the Love Building uh, being, it was, a, it was an artist space. The artwork on the second floor in our hallways is done by an artist named Nico. When this was the artist studio, the second floor was Nico's studio space. So we are super, super grateful. Oh my gosh, and I wrote it down and I forgot. Uh, I wrote to Restoration Program. <laughs> And you're sitting right here. Over the past couple of years, we've worked with the Secretary of State to help people restore their licenses. Right. That whole uh, people driving without a valid license. <laughs> Hundreds of people. Rubina had a client recently, had not had a license in 27 years. He has a license now. <laughs> he has a driver's license now. So we do, whenever you see the world's restoration, or other orgs working on those along with the Secretary of State, but that's Rubina's baby. Rubina has put in so, so, so much work on that, and again, that's the kind of question you can ask today. <laughs> Y'all can ask about licenses and road to restoration, and you know, briefly. <laughs> But uh, thank y'all so much. I hope y'all come upstairs and visit us on the second floor. We really, really all love talking about our work. I can talk to you. I can give you all kinds of statistics, the good and the bad. So please, please come up and visit us on the second floor. And I am super, super, super happy that Dessa, who I've known for not that long, but a long time, <laughs> coming up and talking about one of my favorite, favorite organizations. 
I'm just, uh, come on guys. <laughs>
working in social justice movement spaces for about 15 years at that point as a disabled person. And I learned a lot and I met a lot of cool people, but I kept feeling this weird feeling like there was a major gap around organizing disabled people and our allies. And I kept seeing missed opportunities in movement spaces to include people with disabilities in the fight for justice. And if you're uh, professing social justice values, but you're excluding a highly marginalized group of people in your work, there's a misalignment there that needs to be fixed. That is why Detroit Disability Power was born in 2018, both to organize people with disabilities around issues and also to uh, get our allies and other movement spaces to pay more attention to accessibility and inclusion and to start using learning and using a disability justice framework themselves in their work, whether they were a disability-focused organization or not. In 2021, we became a membership organization. We really want to stay grounded in what the community needs and wants. You don't have to be disabled to be a member. You just have to get down with what we're doing. So this is your official invitation, each and every one of you, to please become a member of Detroit Disability Power and support our work that way. We were super pumped to move into the Love Building last fall. We had been a part of this renovation project from Jump, helping to make sure that this is the most accessible building in the city of Detroit. If you think there's a more accessible one, call me, because I want to go see it, and we'll come back and do something to make this one the best. <laughs> so uh, one of our other internal mottos is, the way we do the work is the work. The way we do the work is the work. That means that we are practicing and modeling principles of disability justice every chance we possibly can. And that means that we are evolving, we're, we're trying stuff out, we're experimenting, we're doing something a different way next time, tweaking and making it better and better, and really showing that access and inclusion is a practice, it's not a destination. Uh, we also help other organizations learn how to do this through our access consulting. We have Ani in the back, and Ruth in the corner over here. Vaccines for disabled residents, and that was because we organized and we saved. 
made a purchase agreement in 2018. And there is a story, and uh, the story goes, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I need to tell the story correctly. I was on the news the other day, and I'm like, did I get that story right? But the lore is that there was a party, all right? And you know, all good things happen at parties, but in any event. At this party was Tessa, uh, Amanda Alexander, who was the founding executive director of uh, Detroit Justice Center, and Jeanette Lee, um, who was the previous executive director of Allied Media Projects. And uh, supposedly, but we'll, we'll maybe, I got a fact checker in the back. Supposedly, they were sitting outside of the bathroom waiting to use the bathroom. And, um, and perhaps there were drinks, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but any event, they were talking about how they all were uh, looking for space at the time and how exciting it might be to actually be not only able to party together, but to work together. And from that conversation began this, this, this journey that we're now, so many years later, sitting in the manifestation of what happened from a party. So, we are having a party here this Friday from 7 to midnight. Let's make magic like that happen at this party. This building that you're in is a $14 million development. So the building was uh, acquired for just a little over a million dollars and then 13 million uh, additional dollars were put into rehab to get this building as beautiful as it now is. This is five floors, 25,000 square feet, and is the home to seven beautiful organizations. On the bottom here are a number of the uh, funders and supporters that uh, helped along the way to uh, uh, get us the financing to get uh, this building uh, up and constructed the way that we desired. And a lot of this, so as we go to the next slide, a lot of this building was, uh, roughly half of that $14 million was spent on resources. So that's a lot of generosity. Our highest hope is that we'll continue to be on receiving end of generosity to, to essentially become not only a beautiful space, but a, a beautiful facilitator of resources to, to many of you that are doing great work. We kind of want to leverage this as a vehicle um, and as an outlet for you all to embed yourselves into this space that we're presently in and other spaces that we're creating to just continue to do uh, and magnify and amplify the beautiful work that you're already doing. I want to mention, uh, coming off of what Dessa said, there was about two and a half million dollars that was invested into this building uh, to surpass. Uh, uh, it has been said that this is the most accessible building in Detroit. I haven't fact checked that, but uh, Dessa, is that true? Okay, as far as we know, this is the most accessible building in Detroit. And um, it costs us two and a half million dollars to do that, but every penny is worth it. And as you go through this building, um, in a minute, once we're done with this uh, presentation, you'll notice that almost every square foot was intentionally designed. Um, there's a lot of love baked into this building, but there's also a lot of features that may not may not to the typical person, uh, to your eye, you may not notice that when you came in the front, our lobby reception desk is purposely lowered so that anyone of any height, as well as anyone of any disability, could come approach that space, be seen, be recognized, and welcome to the space like anyone else. We also invested $1.1 million into building an additional elevator um, so that, you know, I don't know there's two elevators that, that that's going to support us that we want to go up and down the building, but it was also a beautiful additional accessibility measure that we made. Sustainability. <laughs> You'll notice uh, that there's a lot of greenery here, but we take green very serious. And uh, I want to make a quick shout out to uh, Drew, who's right over here. Um, why am I shouting out Drew? Because Drew works for the company called Synergy Energy. And at this moment, we are exploring uh, actually creating a parking canopy where we'll have solar panels um, that grace. So cars will be covered uh, and solar, a lot of our electricity. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to just like clap it up for you. So our mission at Love Building is to, to amplify social justice organizing, nurture creativity, and provide a community space that is inspiring, accessible, and responsive to the needs of the community at large as we continuously learn of the community and bring them into our space to help us understand what will be best for them. Our vision, as I mentioned, this is an experiment. The experiment is going extremely well, but truly, 
other than just being a beautiful home to the, the, the seven great organizations, our vision that our team is increasingly trying to push forward is where uh, this becomes a lab. You are now in the most beautiful lab that you maybe have ever seen. And the experimentation is going to be focused on pushing the boundaries for what community-rooted economic development, community control, and ownership looks like. In addition to that, uh, if we we'll go to the next slide, there's going to be a series of programming that we do that's really concentrated around, I think we're going to go one back, I think. Huh. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. All right. That's cool. Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Well, now let's, let's, let's go back. Let's go back. Right. I think I, I messed that up. I'll put slides. You know, that's why I need a great team to keep me in order. <laughs> These are all our ten partners, which you heard from. Um, while each of them, as you know, are independent organizations, the beautiful thing about each and every single one of them is that they're, in their own distinct way, creating a new pathway for what true freedom, liberation, and joy looks like for Detroiters and beyond. Because as we do the great work that we're doing individually and increasingly collectively, we are, I think, again, setting new precedents for what this looks like. And we are doing a beautiful job, thanks to Allied Media Projects, thanks to Detroit Area Agency, of doing uh, the type of storytelling that can communicate a lot of the wins that we are uh, experiencing and trying to essentially disseminate and distribute that to others that have the same needs and communities that look like Detroit or even look wildly different. When this building was constructed, prior to it actually going live, there was, a, a, you know, you guys familiar with community benefits agreements by show of hands? Phenomenal, phenomenal. So most of you all would know that whenever a project within this city receives a certain dollar amount, then it is mandated that they have to do a community benefits agreement process. We did a voluntary community benefits agreement, um, and we spent two years with uh, uh, 15 beautiful residents on uh, area residents of Core City to ensure that as we come into this space, we're honoring and we are uh, up, we're, first of all, honoring, then we are looking to uh, uplift what they uh, deem to be best for their community. Because uh, like Lauren said before, Detroit Justice Center now. I'm paraphrasing because she said it's so beautiful, but the people that are closest to the problem are. All right, I, I gotta talk to you a little more. I that, right? All right, all right. The people that are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. So uh, we have created a community benefits agreement. We are, it's a five year commitment. Um, we're already ahead of schedule, very right? uh, fortunately. And tomorrow during the town hall, we'll go into more detail to what we've done thus far and what it's still like to do. As I mentioned then, a lot of the programming and events and activities that you're going to see come out of this space are going to be concentrated around health well, and love. So what does that look like? Health, uh, we're actually going to be having uh, Mama Nezra, uh, the founder um, and owner of Paradise Batch of Food. She's going to be doing a community health wellness series. It's going to be a four-week program that I think kicks off next week, I want to say. Um, and I believe there's still spots available for folks, and that's going to be free charge. Uh, another thing we're going to be doing from a health perspective is uh, something called laughing yoga. By show of hands, has anyone heard of this? Okay, nice. Right, so we got some people that are here. Those of you that haven't heard of it, I'm not going to go into detail. I want you to come and experience it. But essentially, this is the type of program we're going to do. Some of it's going to be experimental, some of it's going to be new. We're going to try things. We're going to try to uh, uh, facilitate uh, introducing concepts that might not be uh, well known. So that folks are aware that there are so many YouTube, uh, excuse me, different ways to go about doing beautiful things, and there are so many interventions that uh, that could be utilized and leveraged uh, for that liberation, joy, and freedom that we want amongst everyone and ourselves. From a wealth perspective, uh, we're going to be uh, kicking off a pretty comprehensive financial education program uh, soon called Get Financially Lit. But we're also exploring the partnerships with uh, folks like Chase Cantrell here uh, from Building Community Value. We can clap it up for Chase, absolutely. absolutely. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Building Community Value, amongst other things, they have a beautiful program that's been running for four or five years plus. Eight, excuse me, how time flies <laughs> when you're having fun. Building uh, Better Buildings, Better Blocks is the name of that program, and it teaches uh, native Detroiters, not partners, and hand training folk. I don't know if you call them hand trainers. 
Anyway, <laughs> it teaches you all how to get into developing yourselves. And that has been going on for eight years. I think it graduates about 35 people. Uh, there's two semesters. And so if you do the math, that's like, what, 70 times eight? 560 people plus. And they've gone on to do magnificent things. And that's the type of programming we want to see in this building. And so part of this is an invitation to each and every one of you all. If any of you are doing any programming that's aligned with any of these or our values, we'll kind of move ahead, then, uh, then we are welcoming you. And if you'll keep this under wraps, actually, because we don't want this to, to go out too much, too far, too quickly at this point. But we are welcoming uh, folks that are coming up with programming that's either aligned with the help, help, and love or aligned with any of our values to come into this space and do a program free of charge. And this is how, this is one way we want to leverage this, this beautiful play as a community asset. So these are our values. I'm going to let you guys read it because you guys are phenomenal. Um, I know you're all capable. But vision, visionary organizing, accessibility, placekeeping, intergenerational wisdom, environmental responsibility, community accountability, and creativity. And you'll see as you look through the building that we really attempt to embody all of these values with almost every single thing that we, uh, we attempt to do. Okay? Here are just a couple of projects and initiatives that we're up to. We're going to go into these and uh, as well as some of the events and activities that uh, we're intending to do in more detail tomorrow during our Love Build Town Hall, which is from 5 30 to 8 30. But uh, one project I'll call out right now is a lending library. We put the prices there because, um, you know, uh, for those of you that look to support us, you'll know how you can support us and at what uh, level. But the Lending Library, as you guys all have heard, we have a couple of organizations here that are dedicated to uh, being a platform for media producers. And so when we look at our Lending Library, what we're attempting to do is to create a space where uh, folks are not only able to, you'll, you'll see this when uh, you go around the corner and see a beautiful studio uh, that was uh, produced as a podcast studio and a recording studio for musicians and such. And uh, I know that uh, we had Bryce Detroit here who helped um, support as well as science, um, but I know that there are a couple of you that have created uh, mixtapes and uh, and this these type of things in the past. My man right here? Okay. Uh, that's coming out later. All right, sounds good. <laughs> but the Lending Library will be a place where folks will be able to have access to high quality equipment that will allow them to produce very high quality media out in the world. And um, in addition to equipment, we're also going to have a series of beautiful books. You'll see some of those books, just a, uh, just a, a glimpse of the type of library that we're going to have uh, when you come back out near where the food is. And then we're also going to be um, looking to have a seed library, so folks that have green thumbs, or folks that have an interest in just growing different types of things, this will be a resource for you to come to. So uh, I'm almost done. And I, I feel like uh, I'm happy about that, and I hope you all are happy about that. Because we're about to get into a more exciting part of today. Um, but these are a number of the organizations that help make this possible. Um, so just, uh, if you would join me in just clapping it up for every single one of you. There are a lot of hands, uh, a lot of different organizations and institutions that help make this possible. Um, those are a lot of names, but there is uh, there's quite a bit of white space still on that um, on that board, and um, we are welcoming you all to join this list. All right. Um, so uh, that was my one joke. It didn't go over as. <laughs> all right, all right. I want to thank you all for joining us today, and um, uh, as I mentioned, as we get into uh, tours of the building, which are going to be these kind of stuff guided. Uh, our team, uh, which includes Alan Cook in the back. It includes Kwaku, who's probably out there getting ready for this. Jesse. Mackenzie. Uh, Kwaku, not to be confused with Parker, because we both have the first name, last name. So we got a monopoly on the on the great cool says in this city, which is awesome. Awesome. And then uh, Sakina, who is not with us at this moment, uh, she will be back tomorrow. Um, our team will be made available to you all to kind of, what's that? Oh, and the person that designed this lovely, lovely, lo thank you, 
Tony. The person that designed this, our designer, and our, 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 our dear Taylor Ship, who's out there, each of us will be, uh, we should clap it up for Taylor Ship. <laughs> each of us will be available to you to kind of help support you get to where you want to go as you check out the rest of the building. Um, and then we will also, uh, Abakum and I will be on this first floor kind of guiding you around on all the things that are going on on the first floor. In our restaurant space, uh, which is open, it was going to originally be a restaurant, we're shifting that, so we're actually inviting you all to help us uh, imagine what that spice space might become. And then uh, we also have a rooftop lounge. What you'll notice is that like the building is beautiful, but the building, this is this is a thing that is still evolving. And so you'll notice that uh, some of the spaces, they aren't 100% just yet, it's still great, but they ain't 100% yet. So we're excited for you all to see it in its form today. And then we're even more excited to uh, post this grand opening to welcome you all back and then allow you to see all the progress, all of the beautiful things that come out of the space, and it's gonna be us doing it together.